welcome back to the analysis of PDs. So what? So let me just give you um, a landscape of the today's lecture. Actually, what is the the plan of the lecture? The plan of lecture, the breakdown of the lecture is going to be like that. I will quickly introduce mathematically uh, the Navier-Stokes equation, okay, the Navier-Stokes, so-called Navier-Stokes equation, which has pivotized the, um, uh, the fluid mechanics. So <clears throat> I'll introduce what you call quickly Navier-Stokes equation, and our today's entire discussion is going to be on the Navier-Stokes equation, actually. Um, uh, subject to different initial and different kind of initial and boundary conditions. The next thing that I'm going to talk about is going to be the functional setting for uh, navy stock equation. Okay, so the functional setting for navy stock equation, and then I'll quickly. I'll not get into the too much details of it. You can uh, uh, read it uh, from the book. I'll just give you what do you call the uh, picture because navier stokes equation in itself is a is a huge topic actually. So I'll just you know hit what do you call the very fundamental very fundamental things of this theory and not even in the detail actually. Sir. So my my things are going to be kind of a more of the superfluous actually. Okay, but. Um, uh, I'll try to also bring in the rigor when I'm, you know, when I'm going to do some of the proofs actually. But the, for this introduction and functional setting, I'll be more kind of a rigorous. Then I will. Uh, the, the next thing would be that I will quickly introduce what do you call the so-called stocks operator in different settings, um, and uh, then. Uh, we will basically uh, aim to what do you call solve the navier stokes equation in n equal to two dimension. So the so the bigger picture is that in dimension two n equal to two space, space dimension, I would like to do the existence uh, and uniqueness of of uh, navier stokes equation okay uh, for n equal to 3 i'll put the literature a little bit of literature for you and uh, you have to do the existence you have to read out the existence proof for yourself okay and uh, obviously if you have uh, the uniqueness in n equal to 3 dimensional case actually just let me know because then you're gonna win a million dollar actually. So, you know, the three-dimensional problem is more hard actually. <clears throat> so people are still trying to do it. So this is what is going to be uh, the layout of the today's uh, discussion actually. So let's just start with I'll not, uh, I'll, uh, the introduction to the navier stokes equation. I'll not do the, the, the derivation of it actually. Okay. So I'll, I'll I'll just represent. Okay. I'll just introduce the notations and then you know I'll get into what do you call the equation and talk about some of the boundary conditions and initial conditions and so on and so forth. Okay, so I'm not so in this introduction of say navier stock equation or functional setting and stocks operator, I will not go too much in detail actually. Okay, so I'll just you know kind of superfluously uh, introduce the things. Okay. So 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 let us assume with the notation, assume that you have a, a region in this space, okay, so this is some region in space, okay, you may assume it that that's a region in the space filled by, filled by a fluid, okay, some kind of fluid, and uh, um, say rho of xt represents the density of the fluid um, at position 
position uh, x in space and t is the time okay, at instant t. Okay, so the rho x t is uh, denoted the, uh, the density. Okay, and uh, um, you may assume that okay, like this guy is an R three. Okay, so the omega is an R three, so x is a point in R three. I'll talk more concretely about that. Okay, what are you know some of the reasonable assumptions on the different kind of domains actually? But let me just read out the equation first. Okay, and uh, let's assume that P X T is the um, is is the pressure of fluid at position X at instant T, and say let's assume that U X T okay um, is a vector with the three components say U one x t u two x t and u three x t denotes what do you call the velocity. So this is the velocity of the fluid um, at x in omega and the time t actually, okay, the time instead t which is obviously going to be greater than or equal to zero. Now if you are talking about what you call your fluid is Newtonian, okay, like it can be determined what you call the Newtonian laws, then um, you know, I mean, some of those who have taken the fluid mechanics code, you know how to drive it. Basically, how to drive the Navier-Stokes equation, how to drive the continuity equation through the conservation laws. Uh, but if you haven't, you know, I can send a derivation to you. It's not that difficult. You know, you can easily drive what you call this Navier-Stokes equation. I'm not getting into the derivation of it. So, if the Newton uh, fluid is Newtonian, then then, okay, so if say the fluid is Newtonian, then uh, rho and p e and u, the density, pressure, and velocity, are governed by are governed by following set of equations by by following set of equation uh, so the first equation is this that goes like rho times partial u by partial t times the sum I equal to 1 to 3 ui, uh, ui as these component and partial ui by partial xi minus mu delta u minus 3 lambda plus mu the gradient of divergence of u, the gradient of divergence of u plus the gradient of p equal to f okay so this is what is what do you call um, uh, the first navier stokes equation i guess if that's a first navier stokes equation actually this equation is uh, you know has been has been you can you can drive it in in a variety of ways but one way could be that you can use uh, what do you call law of conservation of mass, okay, and law of conservation of momentum actually to, to drive these equations. Okay, so not getting into the direction, the derivation. I'll put this 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 in the moment. It looks in in in, 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 in 
what you call an ugly form, I'll put it in a more coherent way in a moment. But this is what the original, what you call the Stokes equation is. While, so the, so, so the velocity and the pressure satisfy, you know, these equations. A, a, a velocity, uh, 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 density, velocity and the pressure satisfy this equation, while density also satisfy exclusively another equation, which is called the continuity equation. So the partial rho by partial t plus divergence of uh, rho u equal to 0. Okay. Let me just say a little bit about uh, these quantities that we have, t lambda plus mu. So the, so the mu so the mu can be interpreted as kinetic viscosity okay and lambda is another physical parameter while this f that is a function of position and time fxt you can call fxt as say a forcing factor you can call it as a force per unit volume actually. Okay, so you can call it a force per unit volume. Okay. So Navier Stokes equation, so these two equations put together for the Navier Stokes equation. This is a momentum equation, continuity equation. This comes from um, you know uh, what you call law of conservation of momentum. You have other possible derivations as well, and similarly, you can also get what you call uh, the continuity equation as well. As I said, today I'm not interested in the physics of the equation, while rather I'm interested in the mathematics of the equation actually. Okay? And uh, solving it in, in abstract setting actually. So, this is what is my plan. So, keeping in with this, these two equations, if we we make a lot of simplifications, you know, these original equations are, are, are difficult to solve, they are, they are pretty complicated, um, but you, when you make some kind of, for example, the different people who are doing different kind of fluid mechanics, they kind of have different assumptions on density, pressure and velocity, and, you know, and, and, and initial and boundary conditions so that this complicated problem become a much more simpler problem actually. Okay. Or if you want to solve, for example, these navier stokes equation in a particular context, if you, so you have a geometry, okay, so you have a fluid, that fluid is flowing through a channel, okay, so maybe, you know, the, the channel is uniform, okay, it's not uniform, the channel itself is moving, so in other words, you, you take a geometry and then, you know, you, according to that geometry, you try to simplify what you call navier stokes equation, you come up to the version of a particular kind of an Navier Stokes equation and then you solve it you know regularly through you know your analytic and numerical techniques actually okay so not as I said I'm not interested in any of the geometry today okay so what we do usually so imagine if I say that so let's make an assumption that if, and a reasonable assumption, if the fluid is homogeneous, fluid is okay, homogeneous. Okay, so it's it's like it's kind of a fluid, which is simply a one kind of the fluid. So there is no combination of the fluids. So the fluid has throughout same kind of viscosity. So that the fluid is homogeneous and incompressible. Okay, so the fluid is homogeneous and incompressible. Then the density of the fluid is a constant actually. Okay? The density is fluid is constant and it's independent of space and time and once you have it once you have this assumption that 
you know the density is a constant then you will see that you will reach to some of the interesting conclusion actually so this equation would probably stay same okay but this equation will go away because if rho is, does not depend on space and time then its derivative with respect to time is going to be zero uh, rho is a constant you can pull it out so what you're going to get is a divergence of u equal to zero so 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 the equation is going to equation is going to basically look like this okay the equation will reduce to this so rho times where rho is a constant partial u by partial t plus sum that goes from i equal to 1 to 3 ui partial ui by partial xi okay and uh, minus mu of uh, uh, class u okay class u minus and the say plus what do you call uh, what you call plus gradient of uh, gradient of p basically what will happen so here's the thing actually here's, here's the thing that happens so the continuity equation in the continuity equation if the rho is constant this term will go away then you're going to get a divergence of u equal to zero so the divergence of u equal to zero because u rho is like a constant you can pull it out of the divergence actually so you're going to get divergence of u equal to zero and once the divergence of u is equal to 0, this term would also vanish actually because this has divergence of u. So you're going to get only these terms remaining. And uh, divergence of u equal to 0. So this is what the new form that you're going to get if you assume that a rho is constant and it's homogeneous, density is homogeneous independent of certain actually. So, in its um, to put the Navier-Stokes equation in its famous form, what usually we do that we take say you know rho equal to one. So we, we, we assume that the density is the unit uh, u, uh, u, and uh, we replace replace mu by nu actually. Okay, so usually you will not find mu in the Navier-Stokes equation. Rather, you will find New denoting the new denoting the uh, the kinetic viscosity actually. So this equation would take in, in another interesting form, the final form that I would like to put in. Okay. So so this equation will take off to this form. Um, and obviously, if I say that I take the I, I introduce the gradient operator in other words partial by partial x1 and partial by partial x2 and partial by partial x3 then even this can be this term can be written in an interesting way so the equation will become what partial u by partial t plus this can be written as a, what do you call it, u dot delta u dot delta Okay. U dot delta operator operated on to U. Okay. Minus new plus U plus gradient of P equal to F actually. Okay. And obviously the divergence. Obviously uh, the divergence of uh, divergence of U equal to zero. So the del dot u equal to zero. Okay. So so this is what you call the uh, the interesting form of or the most um, famous form of the Navier-Stokes equation that you usually encounter actually in different kind of settings. So here's a generic equation you know ruled uh, in which the rho p and u the density pressure and u are governed by this equation but if you make an assumption that the fluid is homogeneous in other words that rho is constant the equation will reduce to this equation 
and if you make an assumption that your um, uh, your uh, uh, your uh, uh, fluid is incompressible, then this will lead out to what you call the del dot u equal to zero condition. Actually, so this is this is sometimes also called the incompressibility condition. Okay. Now, these equations, these specific equations, because I'm gonna uh, what do you call use them again and again. So let me just put them for the racket actually. Okay. So I'm gonna put these guys on this blackboard so that whenever I have to kind of uh, recall them, I'll just move this board here and you can have a look then what we are talking. So the work of our equation, so the equation is partial u by partial t u dot gradient operator operating on the u okay, so, and uh, minus minus new new Laplace u new plus u plus plus gradient of t equal to f and the divergence an incompressibility condition that divergence of u is equal to zero. Okay, so this is one of the equations that I'm gonna I'm gonna recall again and again okay, so I hope this works. So what is next? Now let's talk about some of the boundary condition and initial conditions about this. Alright, so so here's the thing. Now, I would like to talk about what you call the assumptions on domain. The assumptions on domain can be various actually. Okay, and the people have studied the uh, uh, you know Navier-Stokes equation or the different versions of Navier-Stokes equation in different kind of domains actually. Bounded, unbounded, Lipschitz in you know uh, Lipschitz domains, you know different kind of domains actually. Okay, so. So, so what we can assume for the sake of simplicity is that omega is an open set in R n. Okay, I'll be interested in n equal to two, but you know you have to take care of n equal to three, especially. And uh, let's assume that gamma is the boundary of um, what do you call? Um, uh, a boundary of the omega and we may assume gamma to be C infinity you know you can assume it to be say CR class for some specified R but let's assume that you know you know the, the boundary is smooth actually okay for this now following the initial and the boundary conditions for um, what do you call uh, the navier stokes equation actually we will consider you consider this navier stokes equation subject to following conditions actually so subject to subject to what so ux0 equal to say ux0 u0 of x so that's the initial condition where the x is from omega Okay, when we will talk about the functional setting, we will talk about that, okay, this u naught belongs to which space, we are going to take it from a specific kind of Sokolov spaces, and uh, the boundary condition, that we have for navier stocks can go like this, that, okay, on boundary, so if you pick a point, x from say gamma then uxt is equal to a fixed function say phi xt okay and I will also talk about um, 
that work assumptions are on phi as well. Okay. Now, this is the case when you assume that okay, omega is open and you know, say bounded actually. So if omega is unbounded, I'll not I'll not be interested in all these kind of conditions. I'll just you know I'm just interested in uh, very specific kind of conditions. I'll be more concrete in a moment actually. So if you if you say if you say your omega is an unbounded subset of Rn actually. Unbounded subset of Rn R, you take omega to be the entire space. Okay, the full space. Then to this condition, okay, you add another condition. You have another condition that goes like that okay, uxt goes to a function psi xt. I'm not talking about the assumptions on psi and phi in, at the moment, I'll be concrete in a moment. But I'll just give you a you know what do you call um, uh, a recipe that if your omega is unbounded yeah, or your omega is a full space then what kind of assumptions you have or what kind of boundary condition you should have actually. So you, you, you should have such a boundary condition but you also have to talk about what will happen to this you know uxt in long run actually okay, as, as absolute of x goes to infinity, in other words that as x goes to plus infinity or uh, minus infinity. Okay. So, if you are considering an open subset, open and bounded subset of Rn, then these two are your initial conditions. If you are considering omega to be an unbounded subset of Rn or say entire space, okay, then along with this boundary condition, we should have this also as an assumption in our boundary condition. Okay, and the another interesting thing, the, the probably the, the most interesting thing in this case, is basically to consider the periodic boundary conditions. Actually, okay, so you will see that quite often when people are dealing with say uh, the Navier-Stokes equation in an abstract setting they kind of talk about the periodic boundary condition quite often actually. Why periodic boundary conditions? Because in, in this periodic boundary condition situation, um, you have, uh, uh, your, your functional setting become much more simpler actually. Okay? And once, you, once your functional setting is simpler, you have a lot of tools, do the analysis. Okay? So, so the periodic boundary conditions are also an interesting kind of a boundary condition. Uh, unfortunately, this periodic boundary condition does not have any physical meaning. Okay, so so it's it's just mathematically convenient something. So the periodic boundary condition goes like this actually. So if so if it goes like this, that if you perturb your x, okay, by some factor L, okay, L is a number, in the ith direction, okay, so E i, E1, E2, E3 is really the standard basis of Rn actually. So if you put up in a space uh, in, uh, in, in the E i th direction, in the, if you put up yourself from the space X in E i th direction by how much amount? Amount L at any instant t, you will return back actually to the same position. Okay, you return back at the same position for all x in what do you call Rn and t bigger than or equal to what do you call zero. Where L is what um, L is a positive constant. It's L is the okay. So you, you may treat L as the period in ith direction okay 